Explore today's must-have trends and innovative styles at Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Shop one-of-a-kind finds in today's must-have trends. Explore wall-to-wall deals, furniture, flooring, mattresses, home accents, seasonal favorites, and more. Discover unique new home decor, pillows, accessories, and more. There's something perfect for your style and budget. There's new inventory every day at up to 80% off suggested retail. Discover the style and savings of Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and joining me from behind the glass is a man that would like to remind us all that a normal life is boring. He is the captain. It's a pirate's life for me. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are proud to be featuring Alpha Abstraction by Wild Leap Brewing Company. This is volume six with an ABV of 8%. Untapped lists Alpha Abstraction as an Imperial IPA double New England that is juicy, dry hopped with lotus hops. It's definitely tropical with hints of orange. On the back of the can is a powerful quote, and it reads, I want them real thick and juicy, so find that juicy double. This, of course, by the great Sir Mix-A-Lot. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And today we are drinking beer thanks to our good friends right here. First up, a big cheers and a couple of cold ones from Michelle B. And a big we like your jib to Rebecca in Oklahoma City. Up north, a Canadian cheers to Cheryl from Telamine, British Columbia. And a big cheers to Anna in Atlanta, Georgia. Also commuting to and from work each day in the Flying Garage ship, we have Emily and the parts that are unknown. Mm. And make last, sure you wash. <laughs> make sure you wash your parts unknown. And last but certainly not least, we send a big thank you and cheers to Caroline. And Car- sweet Caroline in Corumbin, Australia. So thanks and <laughs> cheers to everybody who contributed to this week's beer fund. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. b double you win beer run. And that is enough of the business. Alright, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Emergency. Yes, I'm in the middle of the field. It's safe. We're just pushing guys over. Right here going towards gasoline on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. Got shaken to the woods. Please hurry. Okay, now run that by me. Yeah, we're not talking to him. Hi, right, so you ran into him. Ah, uh, you ran into him. Okay. Got the first guy. Do you need an ambulance? Yeah. No, I need the cops. Okay. Is anybody hurt? Hello? 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 Hello?
Back when we first covered this case, the timeline of events was very short and incomplete. Short because there were not many events on that timeline to discuss. There were just not enough good information out there from all the key players involved in this missing persons case. But starting late last year and continuing through the first five months of this year, information is coming out, and quite a bit of it, in fact. In brief, what we did discuss is 26-year-old Brandon Lawson getting into an argument with his girlfriend that he lived with, driving to his father's house, running out of gas, calling 911, and disappearing. We, like so many, spent a good amount of time trying to decipher what Brandon is saying in that 911 call. That 911 call is the catalyst for why so many people have become intrigued with Brandon's case. His girlfriend, Ledessa, and his brother, Kyle, have done their best to try to keep his story in the media. Because of Ledessa and Kyle, we now have a much greater understanding of the events that took place the day before, the day of, and even some minute-by-minute details up to when he disappeared. So tonight we are going to focus on the timeline that is now being presented. This is the new information that has come out. All right, let's dive into the timeline. Just two quick things before we move on any further. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first, for anyone that has the Stitcher app, Anybody that's been listening to the show for a while now, they know that if you get the free Stitcher app, you can listen to all of our old episodes. The Brandon Lawson, our original coverage was episodes 85 and 86. So on the drop down tab, that's it's 2017, early 2017. Mm -hmm. And also thank you to everyone that joined us last week at crime con. We had a fantastic time meeting everybody. All right. Sorry, Captain. Now on to the timeline. So let's start with Wednesday, August 7th, 2013. According to Kyle, Brandon's little brother, Brandon was looking for some meth. Okay, so Brandon recently took and passed a drug test for work. Right. This was a job that he was going to be starting soon, a job that he was trying to get. Well, he passed that drug test. He got the job. He was going to start the job. So with all of that out of the way, Brandon wants to get high. Right. Now, Kyle knows this for a certainty because he says Brandon called him asking if he knew where he could score some dope. So Brandon gets what he's looking for. Kyle connects him with somebody, and he ends up getting the meth that he was looking for. Right, so this is no longer speculation. Correct, because at the time the speculation was, you know, he had had a history of, of using meth, of purchasing meth. Well, he sounds like he's on something. Yeah, and so the speculation was, could he have been on meth and had a relapse, and this is the result, this this weird 911 call and his disappearance? Well, it could be the result. We don't know, but what we do know for a fact now, yes, he was. That well, Yeah, we know it's a part of the equation now. Yes. So now on to the next day. This is Thursday, August 8th. Brandon went to his home, which is in San Angelo. This is after not coming home the night before. His girlfriend, Ledessa Lofton, she's been Brandon's girlfriend for 10 years. She is the mother of their three children and stepmother to Brandon's eldest daughter. Ledessa and Brandon are arguing. Ledessa is pissed off that Brandon is doing drugs and that he didn't come home the night before. Right. This is when Brandon calls his father, and this is around 11.30 p.m., So very late at night. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding Brandon and regarding meth, the way that this has been described by his brother was that this is the kind of dude that Brandon was. He wasn't somebody that he would call, would say had a meth problem Mm -hmm. or even a meth addict, but he was somebody that would, he would do meth for a day or two and then not do it for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. And then he would do it again and then not do it for months and months and months. So, and again, this is just going off of what his brother Kyle has said. Mm -hmm. On the night of Brandon Lawson's disappearance, we know that he called his father. This is around 11.30 p.m. Now, it is his parents' house is a bit of the new information there, not just his father's house. But according to a phone call he had with his father around 11.30 that night, Brandon was heading to 
his parents' house in Crowley, which is about three hours away. Mm -hmm. It was just past 12.30 a.m. when he called his brother, Kyle Lawson, who also lived in San Angelo, and he's asking for help because he's run out of gas. Now, during this phone call, he says to his brother that three people were chasing me out of town. Brandon said it was, quote, the Mexicans in the neighborhood. And Kyle asked him if he was tripping, if it, you know, if the drugs were causing him to hallucinate yeah. because he's, he's talking to his brother. These brothers are extremely close. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're, they're not just brothers. They're very good friends. They hang out together all the time. They call each other when they need something. And so he's saying, look, my brother didn't sound right on the phone, even going on saying something about Ladessa hired or had some Mexicans from the neighborhood chase me out of town or they're following me something to that effect right that's that's odd now keep in mind we're going off of kyle's words five years later almost six years later Mm -hmm. and he's going off of memory because at the time he's on the phone with his brother he's not writing this down and we don't know what was said verbatim but he's going off of memory for a conversation that he thought one didn't make any sense and two there would be no reason to remember this conversation one part of that that call too was Brandon telling Kyle that he was concerned that Ladessa was going to destroy some of his property. You know, could he even asking, could you go by the house right. and make sure that she's not tearing up my stuff? You know, Kyle's kind of he says he's kind of trying to talk Brandon down a bit during this conversation. One asking him, Are you hallucinating? Are you tripping? Uh Ladessa wouldn't hire some people to run you out of town. Well, he sounds like he's paranoid one from doing the drugs, but also because he was in an argument with her. Yeah. And he, Kyle goes on to say that, you know, she wouldn't tear up your stuff. This isn't really making any sense. And in regards to the statement of the Mexicans from the neighborhood, Mm -hmm. Kyle says, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. There's, there's not like a group of people that they refer to these people with that phrase. Right. So this is completely out of left field to Kyle. At some point, Kyle goes over to Brandon, Brandon's home. You know, Ledes is already there. And this is less than a mile away from Kyle's home. This is to get a gas can. And then he headed out of town with his wife and his four-year-old son. So now we have Kyle going to meet up with Brandon to bring him a gas can. With Kyle's wife and Kyle's son. Correct. Correct. During the the next few minutes, the next hour or so, the brothers keep making calls to one another. But Kyle says that Brandon wouldn't have a full conversation with him, more or less saying a sentence or two before hanging up. Mm. At one point, Brandon said that he was running through a field and was bleeding, which Kyle took as him tripping over some rocks or some other kind of minor accident of the sort. Mm -hmm. Now, at 12.50 a.m., this is when Brandon called 911, which at the time rang to the local nursing home in Robert Lee. The call is hard to understand, uh, but when the dispatcher asked if Brandon needed an ambulance, he said, no, I need the cops. Let's take a listen to that 911 call one more time. 911 emergency. Yes, I'm in the middle of the field. The we're just pushing guys over. Right out here going to a gasoline on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. You got to check the... So there's new information about the timeline after the 911 call. Yeah, and that's what I think is very key here, to keep in mind that all of this stuff that we're going to go through here now occurs after the call that you just heard of Brandon calling 911, asking for help. So at 12.51 a.m., Kyle called Brandon and left a voicemail. At 12.51 a.m., Brandon called Ladessa, but she didn't answer. 
So after their fight, she's now, she's without a wall charger for her phone. She took her phone out to her car to charge it up. It's likely she didn't answer the call either because she's still mad at Brandon or the phone was at this time charging in her car. At 12.52 a.m., Kyle's wife calls Brandon and then called again. At 12.54, Kyle called Brandon. At 12.57, Brandon called his neighbor. At 12.58, Brandon called Kyle and then called again. At 12.58, the neighbor called Brandon three times. At 12.59, Kyle called Brandon. At 1.04, the dispatcher at the nursing facility called Brandon's cell phone back. This is because she's trying to get more information regarding this call where she couldn't understand what he was saying before. Mm -hmm. And she wants to figure out his exact location and what is wrong at the time so that she can send the proper help to the right location. Unfortunately, Brandon did not answer this call. So she left a voicemail and she did try to call one more time after that. Now I want you to keep in mind too, with all of this phone activity going back and forth, Kyle, Brandon, Ladessa, the neighbor, 911, right. all of this, some of these missed calls or some of the calls that go to voicemail on Brandon's end may mean that he's on one of these other calls or trying to call somebody at this time. Right. At 1.12 a.m., Kyle called Brandon three times. Mm-hmm. At 1.15 a.m., Brandon called Kyle twice the last calls he made from his phone at one nineteen, all calls made to Brandon's phone begin going to going straight to voicemail. Now I've actually seen this two different ways. So I think just want to throw this out there to be clear here. There's some good sources for this new information that's come out. And a lot of it's coming from Ladessa and from Kyle, but there was also a really good, newspaper article that came out late last year and this is from the san angelo standard times and the uh the writer is krista johnson in in the article in the standard times is where they state that all calls starting at 1 19 a.m start going straight to voicemail we do have kyle who at a later date said that these calls weren't going straight to voicemail until later until I think he says 3 Mm AM approximately. And he did an interview with our good friends, Tim and Lance from crawl space. So we're, we're pulling all this information from these different points here, Mm -hmm. but around this same time at uh, 119, deputy Neil arrived at Brandon's pickup. He says shortly after 1 AM. This is after dispatch received a 911 call from a trucker along US 277 that reported Brandon's F-150 obstructing traffic by being over the white line. So So it wasn't pulled all the way over. Right. It's still somewhat in the road, and this could be very dangerous, especially at night and it's dark out. The last gas station before Bront, his car, the truck ran out of gas before he could get to Bront, which was not his final destination. Right. The last gas station before his area where his car ran out of gas, the distance is about 30 miles between San Angelo and Bront. So Deputy Neal, who responded to this call, has responded to plenty of calls over his career of people running out of gas in this similar spot. So when he arrives at Brandon's pickup truck, Brandon is not there, but Kyle was just pulling up. This is where things get very weird. I mean, they're weird enough already. When we go through this timeline here, Mm -hmm. we have Brandon on the phone with Kyle and Brandon says to Kyle when, when he's pulling up and the cops there, he's like, I can see you. I'm right here. That's what Brandon is telling Kyle on the phone. So, yeah, so we can assume that Brandon is in a field. He says he's in a field. He can see his brother because his brother's bringing him gas with his wife and his kid. Right. He may not be in a field. I mean, that calls 20 minutes, 30 minutes earlier. But he, 
according but he to can see him right according to what brandon's telling kyle he says i can see you i'm right here mm-hmm. now kyle says he looks around and he does not see his brother anywhere so he doesn't know what he was talking about but he knows of this active warrant out of johnson county for possession with intent to deliver remember we talked about that when we covered it before brandon mm-hmm. had an outstanding warrant and so kyle assumes all right, he's he's just hiding until the cop leaves to avoid getting in trouble with police. But Kyle says the weird thing here is Brandon tells him, tells Kyle to run from the cop. Mm-hmm. And Kyle's like, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not I'm not running from the cop. Right. To which Brandon kind of challenges him, says something like, you know, where's your pride? Um something something to that effect. Right, which is very strange, but for a while it makes you speculate that maybe Brandon is not around the area that he claims to be and that he's maybe just somewhere else and sees some other car. And so when he's telling his brother, I see you, he doesn't really see him. But then when he mentions the officer, you go, okay. He has to be looking at him. He has to be, because what are the chances that he's somewhere else and there's a police officer his truck, and his brother. Right, and that's the thing that Kyle says, and that's the thing that keeps I keep playing over and over in my mind, mm-hmm. is when I, when I take each of this new information and I apply it to the template that we already have of trying to figure out what in the hell's going on, what the hell happened, mm-hmm. you go, okay, well, now I know he's on meth. Maybe he's just hallucinating. Well, he... he, he probably not hallucinating because he's describing what's happening as it's happening well he could go in and out of delusion i mean that's possible but and but then the other thought you'd you go well maybe he's not where he says he is but then again the problem is he's describing what's happening as it's happening there's definitely a heightened level of paranoia yeah and so now we have kyle who firmly believes even to this day that that brandon was looking at him when he said that to him on the phone right and so now Kyle's interacting with Deputy Neal, and he tells him, okay, uh, you know, Brandon's not here, but it belongs to, this pickup truck belongs to my brother, yeah. and my brother, I've been on the phone with him, he's walking along the road somewhere, but his phone keeps losing reception, and purposely leaving out the fact that Brandon, you know, said that he was close by, because right, of, right. again, with the warrant. I think a big major snafu and it's nobody's fault, but a big, huge problem with this scenario as we're looking at it's under the microscope right now, the exact time frame that we're looking at, we have Kyle and deputy Neil there at Brandon Lawson's pickup truck. Brandon's not there. The big problem here I think is that unfortunately neither deputy Neil nor Kyle knew about the 911 call Brandon made. Neither of them knew that Brandon called 911 asking for help just 20, 30 minutes earlier. Right. So we have a couple of scenarios here that are all going down at the same time. We very likely have Brandon hiding from the cop right? because he's got this warrant. We got the deputy who doesn't know that this guy, this Brandon guy, who's, his truck is right here, might be in some kind of danger because he called 911 just earlier asking for the police. Mm-hmm. And we don't we have Kyle who doesn't know that his brother's in danger either. All Kyle knows is that his brother's telling him to run from the cops. And then Kyle goes on further to speculate why the hell would my brother call for help from the police one minute and then the next minute he's telling me to run from the cops. Well, all right, I think that the equation equals drugs. I mean, you know, he's, he's called. Or he was in some type of danger and then was not in danger is a possibility. Yeah. Uh, he he could, he could have called saying that he needed help, mm-hmm. believing that he needed help. And for whatever reason, and before the 20, 30 minutes there. later, yeah. either he gets away from whoever he's running from, mm-hmm. or he gets away from the danger. And now he's hiding from the police and telling his brother to run from him. So either either are possible. Right. But but I also think it's strange. I think it's kind of a paranoia thing. You call your brother to 
bring you gas. And then you make this 911 call. You think at some point he would be saying whatever he's trying to say. And, and this is why I was saying about going in and out of you know, delusions is because what if at the time he's having this delusion and he calls 911, next time he talks to his brother, he's not having that delusion so he doesn't tell his brother about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's the other thing too. It's like we, and we are speculating that he got meth, but we don't know for sure. And was that meth laced with anything? And I know that there's different, um, you know, how uh, pure something is and how that affects the body. I'm not an expert on that, so I don't really know, but I wonder if that has something to do with the situation that Brandon's in. It's it's a possibility, and that's that's the thing about buying illegal drugs is you don't know what is in or what you're actually buying. Right. But uh, but according to Brandon, he it, it was meth he was looking for, and it was meth that he got. Right. Um. So now we have this situation where Kyle and the deputy are interacting with each other, and they're discussing Brandon not being there. They're discussing the truck being out of gas. Right. And Kyle says, look, I'm going to go look for my brother because I brought the gas can. I will go get some gas and get this whole thing figured out, get this truck moved and get him on his way. And Deputy Neal says to Kyle that, well, you don't need to go in this direction on the road. And I, I'm sorry, Captain. I thought I had it in my notes. Going off of memory, I think it was north that he was indicating, mm-hmm. but I, but I can't find it right here at this moment. So whatever direction he's referring to, he says, you don't need to go look that direction because that's the direction I, the deputy just came from. And so I didn't see him walking on the side of the road. Yeah. So Kyle secretly knows he doesn't need to go find his brother because he's just talked to him Mm -hmm. and he's purposely leaving out that, Hey, my brother's got a warrant and he's he's right around here. According to the phone call. (laughs) Really high. So he says that Kyle says that he decided to drive away and just park up the road just a little bit away to Mm -hmm. see if his brother would come out once the deputy left. He says that he sat there for, he doesn't know the exact time, but he says he sat there for a good 30 to 45 minutes. He eventually left because remember he's with his wife and son Mm -hmm. and his son's only four at the time. So his son is hungry and starts crying. And I guess that Kyle was unable to put gas in the can, the gas can that he brought because his check hadn't hit his bank account yet. So he, he's got no money. So he left the gas can in the bed of the pickup thinking that if Brandon came back, he would be able to get the can, see the can, get the can, walk to the gas station, get some gas, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Kyle has to go back home because he's got his little boy and his wife. He drives back to San Angelo. He got some food and stuff for his kid, and he figured that he would just go back out there. He thinks that Brandon is hiding because of the police. Right. And so he's going to go out there. Well, let me pause you for a second, too, because if if Kyle's out there with the police officer, the police officer leaves probably looks for Brandon on the way the police officer does, but probably heads a different direction than he came because he already looked that way. Kyle leaves. He goes down the road. He he parks for a little bit. He didn't see any movement, but you'd think that Brandon at that point would be like, I'm going to try to get in my truck because I'm assuming that my brother would have put gas in, in the tank. But we we now know that there was no gas in the tank. It's weird, too, that communication has dropped off between the two brothers. Yeah, but I think that's due to probably cell service or battery. Right. So if if it was due to battery, then that would make sense with the San Angelo Standard Times article saying that the calls were going straight to voicemail, you know, by 1.30. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. 
This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. We're back. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers. Now, we need to keep in mind that all of the activities that we've really been going through here are technically happening on August 9th, 2013, because the 911 call and everything after takes place after midnight. Right. Okay, so by this point, Kyle is at home. He's taking care of the kid. Kid's fed, probably, hopefully being put to bed at some point. But uh, he decides he's going to head back out to Brandon's truck, thinking that when he goes back, this time he's going to take some gas. Maybe the police officer will be gone by then. He says he gets back to the pickup about 5 a.m. Brandon wasn't anywhere to be found. Kyle says that he was yelling and screaming his brother's name, going up and down the road, and Brandon never comes out. He was even saying something like, you know, like, Brandon, the the, the cops are gone, you know, something like that, right. trying to get his brother to come out uh, from wherever he could have been hiding during that time. But he never sees his brother again. Now, a little after 8 a.m., the Cook County, they had Brandon's truck towed away. According to, this is because, you know, it's it's in the road. It's a hazard. But according to a sheriff's office report, Deputy Neal checked properties in the area of Brandon's truck. So this is less than 24 hours after him being missing. Looking to see if anything had been disturbed or for signs of someone who might have got water from one of these properties. But he didn't see any anything to indicate that Brandon was in that area or had been through that area. Later that day, he checked the same area with a thermal imaging camera. On August 11th, a small private search team gathered and conducted a four-hour search. On Tuesday, August 13th, a helicopter search was conducted over the Colorado River. And the Colorado River is fairly important in this whole story. They also searched with this helicopter along both sides of US-277, near where Brandon's pickup was. Mm Mm-hmm. So to be clear, Brandon's last known location was along U.S. Highway 277 north of San Angelo and right before the small west Texas town of Bront. So so the last call that he received, that Kyle received from Brandon, was the one that he said, I can see you. Mm-hmm. Because wasn't there some speculation that the brother got a call after that? That, that he said, you know, that he was riding with somebody? That... Brandon was riding with someone. Yeah. If, if in fact that happened, we don't have Kyle saying that that happened. Right. So if that was speculation before that could have just been nonsense. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I think that there's there's good room for speculation when you have a story where it's essentially a 911 call and we knew... You see, when we go through this, we went through a half hour of things that took place that we were unaware of when we first covered this. Yeah. And that anybody was really unaware of other than Kyle and Ladessa. Now, some of this information regarding information that Kyle has provided to the public. Yeah. He's been very forward with this information, you know, taking interviews and such. But people wonder, well, because a lot of people have some suspicions of Kyle in general. But he says, you know, I've I've been locked up for a decent amount of the time between when my brother went missing and now. Mm-hmm. Or or when he started providing this information. And so he wants to get this information out there to help people piece this thing together a little bit better. He's really wishing that the the local authorities would do more on their part. Right, but that doesn't rule him out as a possibility that that Kyle did something to Brandon. Well, there's always that. I mean, until we find Brandon alive or Or not, there's always a possibility of just about anything at this point. It doesn't seem that way. My my gut is not saying that he's be, because you'd think that if you did something and then you went away to jail and you're there for a while and you came back out, nobody's continuing to talk about this case unless Kyle does. Yeah, if 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 Kyle and Ladessa would let this thing go away, it probably would. We all we would be left with is this nine one one call that keeps popping up on podcasts and YouTube and that's about it. But, but as far as the local authorities are concerned, Mm -hmm. like I said, if Kyle and Ladessa would let this thing go away, it would the local authorities, they've conducted some searches over the years, but we have Ladessa who has brought in private investigators, private search companies to, to search that area. Now this is Texas and these, some of these people in this area own a good deal of land mm-hmm. and some of them are not very willing to allow these private companies to come in and search their land. Mm-hmm. So we have a difficult situation here where, well, well, and I know his girlfriend said that, that she can't really decipher the nine one one call, but do we have Kyle saying that he's listened to the call and this is what he thinks was said. Well, uh, so we, we actually have a couple of things and let's, that's good. I'm glad that you brought that up. We will go through that right now. So according to Kyle, I didn't get like a minute by minute from Kyle on what he thinks Brandon is saying at different points. Mm-hmm. There is one point as far, as far as the word staper goes, I believe Tim and Ann, well, so Tim and Lance asked him if, if he would, if, is that some kind of slang, you know, from your, your area that you live in that, that he's referring to something as a yeah, staper staper. And Kyle says that it's not slang. He says that he believes his brother was trying to say state trooper, but just misspoke. Right. And yes, that's essentially when you really boil it down that is just a guess on Kyle's part, but keep in mind, I feel he, like, yeah, I feel like this, his... I feel like Kyle knows Brandon better than anybody else. Yeah. We do have a friend of Brandon's that's from, from the same general area. And we have Ladessa, the girlfriend, they've put some of their two cents in on what they think Brandon is saying. Mm-hmm. They say that they can understand some of the words that Brandon is saying, some of the words that may, maybe you and I can't understand. Right. So I'll try to break this down without going too, you know, getting too confused here. But this is a general, this is what they believe him to be saying. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm in the middle of a field. And then something, something just pushed some guys over. Out here going towards Abilene on both sides. Mm-hmm. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. Something chasing me through the woods. Please hurry. We're not talking to him. I accidentally ran into him. Mm-hmm. Got or shot the first guy. Yeah, no, I need the cops. 
Right, which is interesting because the the part of uh, we're not talking to him, to me, that, you know, we have him then talking to his brother not much later saying, hey, we're not talking to the cops. And so that would go along with with what he stated to 911. If he's in this paranoid delusion state, his thought is still, I can't talk to the cops. So. Well, I think the thing that's interesting here is, of course, there's still some words that they can't make out themselves. Mm -hmm. The friend of Brandon, he believes that maybe Brandon was looking at his phone, that the phone is not up to his ear, that he's possibly could have it on speaker or, you know, that he's looking at the phone, that the phone's in front of him. Right. And the friend, this is just a belief. His friend believes that on occasion when you, when it sounds like Brandon's coming in or out or you can't decipher a word, he thinks that Brandon might be changing directions, that he's looking towards something. Right. So yeah. that you're you're kind of losing his voice there for a little bit yeah, that when, he, make, when he that turns away. Yeah. yeah. So I found that to be extremely interesting. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that I found very interesting was the something he, you know, I, I like this friend of Brandon's. He's not going to claim to know what Brandon's saying when he can't understand him. He's not just, he's not filling out the whole, you know, puzzle for us. Right. He's saying, these are the, these are the words and things that me and Ladessa can make out and that we think he's saying. And then here's a couple points where we don't know. We just don't know what he's saying there. So mm -hmm. the phrase of something just pushed some guys over. Well, it's good that they're doing that, though, too, because on, on one hand, they could give you what they think. But I think by omitting that, it, you don't put any ideas into other people's heads. Well, it adds to clarity by not mm -hmm. by not including that. So the phrase of something just pushed some guys over. Man, I'll tell you what. The, the speculation on what that could have meant. And if in fact, Brandon is saying state trooper, mm -hmm. that has caused some wild thoughts and theories. And I, and I, it's okay that it has, because I think we've all had some pretty wild thoughts and theories on what he could be saying, what he's trying to describe on this one nine one one call. Mm hmm. But I remember reading one way back when, when we covered it, where somebody had speculated that maybe a state trooper was pushing or somebody was pushing people off of the bridge mm. over the Colorado River, like just doing away with them, which made no sense at all to me. Mm -hmm. But this statement of them saying, hey, we believe he's saying just push some guys over. He went, they go on to clarify what they think that he means by that. They think that they meant with the car out on the road. You know how you can kind of run somebody off the road? Right. That's what he, that's what they think that Brandon is trying to describe there when, it, when they believe him to be saying, just pushed some guys over. Right. And, and or I've some guy over. Right. And I've always thought if he's actually saying state trooper that, you know, maybe he said push when he meant pulled. You know, hey, he just pulled some guys over, right? And again, it's it's really hard to tell. And I I think uh, the meth doesn't have to be laced with anything. It is meth. It, it's going to create enough issues in Brandon's. Well, he's in an altered state. That's there's no right arguing that. But but I I think like I said, I think there's something, you know, PCP or something involved with this meth that caused him to uh, see things that weren't there. Yeah. And so, you know, I went over a little bit, some of the searches and I wanted to make sure there were more. Uh, I, it's kind of boring to go through all these searches that we know have turned up nothing. So I won't bog the show down with that at this moment, mm -hmm. but I wanted to make sure that I pointed out because when we covered this before, it was unclear to me that there were this amount of searching for him. Yeah. And so there were more searches than what we discussed in our first two shows. 
it's important to to say that because it, we want people to know there has been efforts made to try to locate Brandon, but adding to adding to the confusion of this case for law enforcement and for Brandon's family is we do have Kyle who says, look, once I figured out that Brandon was calling 911 for help, that that changed everything for Kyle Mm -hmm. because it's a whole different scenario for this man. Now he had a situation before where he thought he was helping his brother all along. I'm going to bring a gas can. I'm going to bring some gas. Oh, you can see me talking to the cops. I'm not running from the cops because I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm not going to tell them where you are because you got a warrant. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, once he learns that his brother called 911 for help, he's been extremely concerned. So he goes to law enforcement and he he told him straight up, look, uh, I I need you guys to go look for my brother because he he was in that area that night. Well, how do you know? Well, I know that because he called me and said that he could see me talking to the deputy. Right. And I didn't know that he called 911 earlier that night looking for help, or I would have told the deputy, my brother called 911. He says he's around here somewhere. But when Kyle pulls up, the the deputy is already there. Yes. So it's according to deputy Neil, he arrived like seconds before, mm -hmm. before Kyle arrived. Yeah, because you wonder if that's the deputy that he's that he's possibly that Brandon's possibly talking about on the phone. Mm-hmm. But if he's claiming I just got there seconds before, then it'd have to be somebody else. Yeah, and the other thing too is remember the deputy is arriving at the pickup truck because the pickup truck is called in by the trucker, right? Not by Brandon, obviously. During his call for help, he, he they're unable to determine where he is and what right. kind of help he actually needs. So the thing regarding the the call from the trucker, there's been a lot of speculation as with with Brandon's 911 call that there was speculation that the call could have been edited or at the very least it's a longer call and somebody clipped it and cut it, made it shorter. So we're only hearing a portion of it. Right. There's been people close to the case that have confirmed a couple of things. And this is not law enforcement. Uh, These are people with Brandon's best interest in mind that have said the 911 call by Brandon has not been changed or edited or shortened in any manner. And they also say that the call, the 911 call from the trucker did happen. That that 100% happened. It's not something that, you know, because you get some of these conspiracy theories that are going, well, the cops did something wrong here. Now they need a reason to explain why they were at his truck, but they couldn't understand where Brandon was. Mm-hmm. So they manufactured this 911 call from a trucker. And people close to Brandon and his family have said that 911 call from the trucker did happen. Right. It's very unclear, like, with these conspiracy theories that, that they think that he's. I'm, on one hand, Brandon's telling his brother, hey, I'm, I'm being chased by this, this group of Mexicans it's as if he would know who, who he's talking about, that they're right. trying to run him out of town. That's on one thing. Then he just talks to 911 operators. Still sounds like somebody's trying to run him out of town. But then the cops are involved. But, th- but that's what's weird is I think the state trooper and the pushed him over or whatever – why would you be calling 911 to get cops to come out there if a state trooper was already there? Especially when you know that you're going to be able to get a hold of your brother. Yeah. Or your father. You know what I mean? Other you have other means of help. And you know what I mean? It's you if you see a cop doing something wrong, I don't know that my first instinct is to call the cops. Right. Yeah. So it's it's a really difficult thing. I think though that we have to go off of Kyle's statement from earlier in the night where he even asked his brother, "Are you tripping?" I think that maybe a lot of this confusion is Brandon's words, Brandon's movements, his uh communication with 911 and with other people. I think it has really confused a situation that might be a lot simpler than then some of these wild theories would would make it to be or make it out to be. 
Right. And I, I think that what's sad here is here's a guy that was obviously clean enough to pass a drug test, was going to start a new job, had a family that uh, he needed to be supporting. He decides to use these drugs, which then make you lose your mind. He gets in an argument. It's like this perfect storm. I got in an argument about the drugs, so I can't go back home. So I got to go to my parents' house, which is really far away. And guess what? He runs out of gas. And the communication between the brother and, and 911 and all that stuff, he gets out into this field because he can't, you know, basically once he runs out of gas, he can't be sitting there and have a cop pull up on him. One, because of the warrant, but two, because he's high as a kite. And I think he gets into a situation where he ends up losing his his whereabouts, losing his location. And and this is pretty a big, vast area, right? So he could have wandered for a very long time and, and got himself even more and more lost. Which is weird and difficult, though, too, because... At one point, he's, I mean, he's alive, communicating with his brother. Yeah. I can see you. I see the deputy. I see my truck. He's not terribly far away from, so it, it's it's just weird. It's weird that, that something happened between that last communication with his brother mm-hmm. that's, that prevented Brandon from getting back to his truck. Okay, so we can... I think safely speculate that he is on drugs and the drug is meth. We have no clue how much, right? Well, we don't need to speculate. I mean, we have Kyle. We can't say with 100% certainty, but we have Kyle saying this is not out of character for my brother. He was looking for meth the day before. I put him in touch with somebody that sold him some meth. Mm Mm-hmm. I spoke to my brother the day that he went missing. It's not my belief that my brother was on meth. I know he was on meth. Right. So if, if we are to believe Kyle, then it it sounds like 100%. And according to Ladessa, that's why she's angry with Brandon that he, that he relapsed on this. My point being, so we can safely say that's what we think is happening. We don't know how much. So is it possible that, I mean, he he obviously, let's say he did enough to alter the way he was thinking, paranoia, delusion. Is it possible that he ends up ODing out in the field uh, from from this drug use? It's possible, and then that's where you the elements become an issue. And I understand that they searched for him, but how far did he go? And is it possible that he was taken away from? Um, from the site that he OD'd, you know, by an animal or something. Well, and he could also have gotten trouble after this communication. I mean, there's still, just because these drugs are involved, I don't think means 100% that he didn't run into somebody that night, and that's why he's never never come home. Right. So, but one one thing that I was getting to earlier is one problem that, that they have and that the family had early on was local law enforcement was suspicious of two things. One, after hearing about the the drugs and after hearing about Brandon not coming home the night before, storming out after an argument, local law enforcement believes that Brandon is moved on to another woman. Mm. And they also believe and don't believe Kyle Because they think that Kyle assisted Brandon in leaving somehow. They think, you know. Even though he's with his wife and kid. Yes. So he got them involved as well. No, their thought is after the, after the truck was found that at some point Kyle took Brandon somewhere, drove, drove him elsewhere. He pulls up, Brandon calls him, says, I can see you. Don't talk to the cops. He, he ends up talking to the cops. Cop leaves. He sits around for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. He goes back home, gets his kid some food, puts him to bed, 
goes back out, gets Brandon, and then helps him go to on to the next woman. Well, you, well, any version of that story. I mean, right. you can have any any bazillion ways that could happen. But their their very general statement to Kyle is, "We think this occurred, and we think you helped him." So, one difficult thing too here, and this is very. I find this to be probably the most interesting thing of all. Um, So then he's just going to continue to, again, nobody's talking about this case unless Kyle talks about it or, or, you know, so he's going to go out of his way to do interviews and talk with people just to keep up the lie. I don't, I don't know. I I can't, I can't um, rationalize their thinking. Real quick, before we get into to the thick of this, we should point out, too, that it is Brandon's friend that says, remember those noises that are heard in the background of the 911 call? Yeah. Some, some people have said that uh, could be a shot, could be the, a gunshot, could be this, could be that, could be the other thing. And what a lot of people pointed to, especially people from the area, they're saying, look, that noise that you're hearing is very likely vehicles or semi-trucks going over the bridge. Mm -hmm. Now this is the bridge for the Colorado river. And Brandon's friend says the exact same thing. He says, look, I've been out to that area. That's the noise that that bridge makes when heavy vehicles are going over it. The interesting thing here is he would have been, he would have had to been somewhat, well, at least, at least within an earshot, right. Of that location. Right. If that is in fact, correct. But we do have some cell phone ping information here. Mm -hmm. So according to his friend, Brandon's friend, a cell phone ping at 1250 a.m. This is right around the time Brandon calls 911. According to his friend Jason Watts, the phone is pinging near Brandon's truck at that time. Okay. Then later we have more ping information. So during the course of this night, some of the interaction that we listed as stated as from Brandon to Kyle or Kyle to Brandon at one of these points, it's actually Audrey who is Kyle's wife. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because Brandon might be trying to reach his brother, but the, the phone is in the, his truck or, or something, something to the effect of Audrey had some communication with Brandon. And this took, takes place around one eighteen AM it says Brandon is talking. Audrey's listening. Brandon's on the phone, but the phone connection is cutting out. So she can, can't make out what he is saying. She says that, uh, this is, this is the conversation where Brandon says that he is bleeding. Remember, we said that his brother took that to mean that he was in some kind of accident or tripped and fell, hurt himself when he was out there running. This is interesting because this is backed up by their father, Brad Lawson. He has commented publicly on how dark it would have been out there at that specific area. Talking about that time of night, very early morning, and given the terrain of and what he knows about the terrain, he's saying if Brandon was out there running in the dark, it would have been very easy for him to trip, fall, injure himself. So at this time, at this one eighteen a.m., one nineteen a.m., Brandon's phone is pinging north of where he left his truck. This is up by the Colorado River. Mm-hmm. 30 minutes earlier, when the 911 call is made, it's pinging near his truck, and then it's now pinging near the Colorado River north of where he left his truck. And what's interesting about that too, is that they did a search. They did multiple searches, but one of the searches I found had information where they were searching with dogs. Okay. And using these dogs, they were tracking a scent that moved in that same direction from his truck, from where his truck would have been. Now they didn't go up far enough North to get to the Colorado river or to get to where that cell phone is believed to be pinging from right at that time. But the dogs moved in the same direction that the cell phone ping technology is telling us that the phone was moving in. Yeah. 
And and so that would put him at that river and you would an accident could have happened then. Yeah, so that would put him very close to the Colorado River. Um, it would be interesting to see because now I'm kind of just left with the thought that, all right, he is either in that location near the river or he's ended up in the water. Right. And he either ended up in the water by accident or somebody put him there. Well, and that's evidence. And, and now we don't have, we don't have to speculate everything that he's saying. We, we know that, and they probably have a time of the cell phone ping. So it's probably right after the, yeah, it's one eighteen one nineteen of the Northeast ping. Correct. So this is after he talks to his brother. So he starts heading this way again. You have somebody that's high on drugs and could, could he just go, Oh, I'm going to cross the river and just not make it. But the difficult thing here is that technically that would put him not where he says he was or not where Kyle believed him to be when Brandon saying, Hey, I, I can see you. I'm, you know, I'm, right here yeah but maybe he can maybe he can see you but from way far away you know he he, because he sees the the cops lights or whatever i mean who knows well this would have been hundreds of acres right but my point is that we have evidence that after he talks to his brother the last time he is heading away from his truck and heading towards water and we have a person that is obviously um, not of the right mind and who knows what kind of accident could happen with the river. Well, and I think the, the saddest part of, of this that I came across in this new information. Well, here's my, here's my other point though, too, is even if his phone was dead, it possibly ping several more times, right? No, there needs to be some kind of reason for it to ping. It has to do, it has to complete some kind of function for it to ping. Like a call, a text, accessing GPS. Yeah, but see, I wonder if it would ping, because if you go in and out of service, w- would it ping then? You know, because let's say you, Probably. You, you walk a little bit further this way, out of service. Go a little bit this way, you're back in service, so would it ping again? So my point being is that the the phone doesn't ping after that point. That that puts Brandon to that river, and there's no pings after that. I I don't think we should assume everything. I don't think we should speculate everything. But to me, it's like there's evidence that puts him to that river, and and then there's no no more uh, cell phone ping ever. Because also, if, if he if he left and went with another woman. At that point, he just stopped using his cell phone altogether. Never charged it ever again. Never turned it back on. It's more likely that he ended up in the river, and that's why we have no more cell phone ping because that water, you know, because the the phone is submerged in water. One of the saddest things that I came across when looking for new information on Brandon Lawson's case is a statement from Ladessa who's talking about the 911 call. And she says that the two older girls listen to it on YouTube trying to make sense of what Brandon is saying. And she adds, it just hurts me that I can't find him for them. Ladessa believes someone knows something about what happened to Brandon. And it sounds to me like Brandon's family believe foul play were involved. She has said, and this was as of the... 2018, late last year, the San Angelo Standard Times article. Mm -hmm. Ledessa has said that she has not been able to find out the identity of the dispatcher that Brandon spoke to that night or the trucker that called about the pickup, that called 911. People, these are people that she and the family would like to talk to to see what they think about what happened to Brandon. Well, and you just feel so bad for his family and his friends, especially the brother and his girlfriend that, that talked to him that that night because it seems like they were so close to helping him and that if there was foul play or 
some kind of accident that there were they might have been yards away from saving Brandon's life. Make sure you check out our website, truecrimegarage.com. We have our Crime Con review that you can listen to for free. It's an off-the-record episode, but you can check it out for free. It's up on the website. And check out our bonus show on Stitcher Premium, Off the Record. Nick's on vacation this week in Florida. I hope he's having a good time. He did a lot of work so we could still put out this episode this week, and he could still go on vacation. So until next week... Be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can live out your master chef dream when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that.